spending the time with Stu and and the guys and and learning the craft there. How long is it before you kind of get passed back in the direction of Vince and the WWF? So, um, you know, it was a long time ago, and it's a long time since I've been recalling these events. So um, some of it, I talk about it more, I remember much more. But I'm not sure. I think it must have been six months or a year at least. And I also had some tours in Japan, but I'm not sure what happened when and where, whether I was to the WWF first or after. And I was in the WWF a couple of times. Uh, and so uh, I was also sent out to wrestle with, uh, oh, I should go back to something else you said before I move forward, just for a sec. I don't want to lose the thought of this. I didn't see Brett so much, except he, he was working all the time and Jim Neidhart. And so they didn't come around so much. And I think when they got off the road, I might see them here or there. They might come down to the matches and watch it briefly. But then I think he wanted to be with his family. So you would maybe see him or meet him. And he's a somewhat of a reserved person too. He's a lot like his dad in a way. He's got a lot of gravity, but he's a little bit reserved. And he's taking everything in. He's very observant, but I think he wanted to be with his family, so he wouldn't hang around that much. You'd see him briefly, and you were excited to see those guys, uh, you know, to see what you could learn from them, or also to hear any input from them, but then they were gone. Um, uh, then back to the WWF, so at some point, too, they sent me out for more, I don't know what term I should use, more reprogramming or whatever, um, and I was sent to Boston to also work with Killer Kowalski, Walter Kowalski, a very famous wrestler, you know. Who he is. Mm -hmm. And so I learned some different uh, styles and some different things from him. And of course, I learned some other things from um, in Japan. And uh, oh, that's true too. When I was in Calgary, Mr. Hito from Japan also was training me too. So it's happened a lot. There was a lot of different chefs working with uh, preparing me for whatever was going to come my way. And then obviously the infamous WWF debut, October 7th, 1986, Rochester, New York versus Brett the Hitman Hart. And it's crazy to think of I hope legend. It wasn't infamous. Well, it's iconic and legendary. It's just such a great match, but obviously it yeah. became famous because it yeah. got lost. <laughs> right. I see. I see. Uh, yeah. Um, so I went in that night and uh, there was so much going on. It was like, you think that all of the different sports and, you know, uh, McGee on deck in, in 10 minutes or McGee on deck in five minutes to lift or to compete in this sport or that would prepare you a little bit. But there was such sensory overload when I showed up at a WWF taping. Thank goodness I already had that previous experience because there was a lot going on. It was really bedazzling. Uh, so many... Um, amazing athletes there some who are just you know like raw uh physical ability uh in the typical sense of an athlete others who are amazing entertainers and they're all there together and then you've got these creative marvels who are running the whole thing and there's kind of a plan but then they're they're on the wing too and figuring it out as they go and 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 you've got uh, tens of thousands of people in the audience. And um, I was being shoveled all over the place. And people were looking at me. And I was being taken from this location to the other. And then you would hear people saying things uh, you'd catch in your earshot. I would go by and, you know, some of it would be complimentary. Some of it wouldn't be. Or somebody shouted out. And somebody in the authority, I don't remember who, shouted out, put him with. Hercules Hernandez, and I listened to the tone of it. I listened to the tone, and it sounded like an adversarial. The tone sounded adversarial. So I'm going, you know, you're trying to adjust. 
to whatever um, might come your way, and you're immediately you're picking up the information. So anyway, when it finally came around to who uh, that I was going to wrestle with Brad, that was um, that was comforting and reassuring in a way because um, I was trained in a style that he was the best example of. So, um, and he would have been, if anyone would have been aware of what uh, I could do or couldn't do, um, sight unseen, because I don't know if he'd ever seen me wrestle before, and nobody there probably had. Uh, I, I had the, you know, a good shot of being able to to do some of my my moves and my things uh, to showcase what I could do in, in that instance. Absolutely, yeah, and it's quite a debut, and it's so interesting because when we used to tape trade years ago, there was no footage of this tape. We couldn't get this tape. We we try to get this tape. There was always talk of this infamous match, this lost match that was a great match. It was your WWF debut, and obviously it really showcased you, but also, which people you know found out later, that Brett was a really great wrestler. He wasn't just some tag team wrestler. He was a great wrestler. So when this actually popped up not that long ago, it was an assistant of an assistant of Brett actually had a copy of the tape and they found, you know, the quote unquote lost tape. It was just amazing because it's the holy grail to guys like me and Chad who were tape traders that we never saw this match. Did you know it was as revered and, and this many people wanted to see this match? I know I knew there was a lot of buzz about the match and that it had never been seen, but I don't, I didn't know what happened to the tape. I just assumed that the WWE had it in their possession, and, and um, I, but I didn't know. I'd never seen it. I got to see it in Las Vegas recently, mm-hmm. and I was I was impressed and amazed. Um, there was a number of things in it that impressed me. I mean, I was really big and heavy at the time. I was amazed at how uh, capably uh, Bret Hart was able to lift me. Uh, and I also was, you know, I was glad that I got to show some of the athleticism that I worked so hard to to create over many decades of of applying myself. And then the training, of course, that uh, the Hart family had put into me. So, um, you know, as an athlete, that's a lot of what you want to do. You want to show the hard work also that you put in, but also uh, that everyone else has put into you because you've had a lot of to do. When anyone who does a good performance, um, they've had a lot of trainers and a lot of people really put their, their heart and their soul into giving you those abilities. And so it's great when it all, when, when, when you get a chance to do that. So I was stoked to be there and then meeting Vince McMahon, getting to talk to him. And, uh, I mean, it was just, um, it's a kind of synergy in there. The the combination of all those individuals brought together. Uh, wow. It's just the, the, the power of the light emanating from that was just so amazing. And I hope the match reflected that. Such a great match. And to think, you know, I've been waiting so many years to see it. And then you read the story in Bret Hart's book and, you know, Vince, as soon as he saw you, literally doing flips like Mega Man, but you're 6'5", 275. It's just such an amazing athletic ability you have. One of the strongest men in the world, but yet you could do flips and you can go off the top rope and do a flip, and then you could do a front flip, literally like Mega Man. It's just, you know, crazy. So, you know, they say Brett is, you know, such a great in-ring wrestler, such a ring general, but Pat Patterson and Vince are backstage watching this, and you read Brett's book, and Pat is saying, Brett is a future champion. Vince is saying, you're the future champion. You're the future Hulk Hogan. Was that ever mentioned to you that after the match, Vince was like, man, I, you know, I love this guy. Look, you know, he's got the size, the look, the athletic ability. Did he ever say anything like that to you? So that's interesting because I, you know, I don't recall anybody gushing over me verbally. I certainly knew people were watching me and I had a lot of attention. But in terms of somebody giving me like an over-the-top appraisal like that was just, you know, 
No, but I don't think that was their style. They weren't prone to gushing or overly praising. And, uh, and so, no, I don't recall that. I do not recall that. Um, I, you know, I had audience with all those guys, including Pat Patterson and, um, and just kind of getting to know everyone. Um, but I felt, despite all the other things I've said, there's also an element of, I don't want to say matter of factness. They're professional. Everyone's professional. And so it's expected you're going to go out there and you're going to do something really. You didn't get there. I mean, it's hard to get in there. And so... If you if you got in there, you're of course you're going to do something um, that's that's high level or elite. Otherwise, you 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 weren't there. And I love that WB Network and WB obviously did a documentary on it. They interviewed you. They interviewed Brett. It was called Holy Grail, WB's most infamous loss match. And I just think it was so cool that you were a part of it as well. So how does that kind of all go down? with them interviewing you for the documentary as well. Um, it was all really interesting. And like I say, it helps me to, to bring back some of the little anecdotes I have of different interactions going on there. I mean, I told you about, I, you know, when they were trying to figure out who I was going to go out with, uh, who I was going to compete against in the, the match. Um, and it ended up being Brett, but it could have been Hercules Hernandez. It could have been someone else. There were other things you would, hear people, they're not talking to you, but they're talking like you're not there or they're 10 or 15 feet away and you, you hear something. Uh, I came from the bodybuilding world, so when I selected my trunks, you know, I went to a bigger trunk, like a wrestling-style trunk, but still probably not typical. So somebody else was, was, was saying, he can't go out there in those trunks. Those trunks are too small. And I recognized also when Brett and I were in that match, and he goes to throw, uh, lift me back into the ring. He couldn't torture test my friggin' trunks. I'm glad those things were well made, and well engineered, <laughs> and, and didn't uh, didn't go uh, off because they friggin' uh, they they definitely stood the the test. Um, so I get to show some of my explosiveness that most people don't have, and that uh, you know um, world champion uh, strength athletes have. I recently did the genetic testing 23 and me, and they, they all tell you all these, um, genetic predispositions you have. And they say, wow, uh, there's various markers for the explosive gene and I have all of them. And so, you know, that's something you're just born with. But then yeah, you express it, you express it by training it. Right. And there's no doubt about it. I mean, that's perfect if, if that test is accurate, which it seems like it is. That's a perfect description of kind of the athlete that you were and the amazing things you were able to do. As far as that documentary, were you surprised 33 years later that not only the match pops up, but that they want to do a documentary on it, that they really wanted to make a big focus out of this match? I'm appreciative about that. Um, I think that the... You know, that makes me feel good that, uh, that they um, recognized and um, wanted to showcase what happened a long time ago. But the history of wrestling is interesting. And, um, of course, that rose all the way to the top with pro wrestling. And so mm -hmm. um, that was also... Uh, Great. I, I mean, if I'd been more successful, and I, I did wrestle for five years, so I had yes. some success. Yep. And I had a lot of interesting matches. And who you get paired up with, you know, is makes for a lot of those stories and the possibilities of what can happen. But it was great fortune to um, have crossed paths with Brett that night, and then uh, that's there, and it's there for all time. And uh, you know, it's, it was a significant match for me and for him. I, one thing that fascinated me when we were at StarCast is Brett was talking about how he struggled to get recognition for his wrestling ability at some point in WWF. Now, I, that was unknown to me. I assumed he just was always recognized as top tier. But apparently he also had to overcome 
a lot of uh, people who weren't, you know, didn't they didn't recognize what his style or ability was. And so that was that was a big wake up for me because I, I didn't know that. 